every single book in the world must have an author. The yes. Noble Qur'an is, therefore, no exception. It is a book, so it must have an author. All Muslims believe that Allah is the one who revealed the Qur'an to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But those who do not believe so, they think otherwise. But who do they think wrote the Qur'an then? I mean, if they don't believe that the Qur'an is from Allah, then who is it from then? Because there aren't really many options, since Prophet Muhammad was the one who dictated the words to his companions, the writers of Wahi, to write it down. So, if they don't think it's from Allah, then it should be one of these four options, simply because there isn't any other possibility. So, it should either be that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, authored the Quran himself. The second possibility would be that he used the previous books, like the Bible or the Torah, to write the Quran. Third, a Christian or a Jewish person had helped Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to write the Quran. Or fourth, it was Satan who had helped the Prophet to write the Quran and tell him about the news of former nations that he hadn't witnessed. So these four are the only possibilities there are. If the Quran was not from Allah, there are no other options as to where the Quran came from. So, if we can disprove or refute these four possibilities, then we're left with the only remaining possibility, which is that it is from Allah. So let's look at these possibilities one by one and see how they stack up. First, Prophet Muhammad was the one who authored the Qur'an himself. And if you do think so, then how can you explain the following problems? The first problem is the style of writing. We do know how the Prophet talked and what his style looked like. How? We do indeed have thousands of ahadith, which are the quotations and sayings of the Prophet. So we know exactly what the style of these sayings look like. And it doesn't take an expert to realize the big difference between the style of the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the style of the Qur'an. It clearly shows two distinct styles of writing. The second problem, blaming the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the Qur'an. The Qur'an contains several blaming verses, or in Arabic, <laughs> Ayatul Itab, where the Prophet, peace be upon him, is blamed for certain actions, like... عفى الله عنك لما أذنت لهم حتى يتبين لك الذين صدقوا وتعلم الكاذبين. Or يا أيها النبي لم تحرم ما أحل الله لك تبتغي مرضات أزواجك. Or in this example, عبس وتولى أن جاءه الأعمى. And there are many other examples belonging to the same category. So, if it was the Prophet himself who wrote the Qur'an, why would he blame himself in front of his companions? It is just simply not logical. The third problem is the prophecies. The Qur'an contains many prophecies about many events, some of which actually came true in the time of the Prophet. Like the one in Surah Ar-Rum. غُلِبَتِ الرُّومِ فِي أَدْنَ الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ فِي بِضْعِ سِنِينَ Or the prophecy about the liberation of Mecca or Fath Mecca. In Surat Al-Fatih, 
لتدخلن المسجد الحرام إن شاء الله آمنين آمنين محلقين رؤوسكم ومقصرين لا تخافون If the Prophet wrote the Qur'an himself, how could he have known things that were going to happen in the future? Wouldn't it be a big gamble losing your status among your companions if he predicted that something would happen and it didn't happen? The fourth problem is the delay of revelations. In certain incidents, the wahi or the revelation was delayed. Like when a Jewish man came to the Prophet, asking him about the people of the cave. But the Prophet said that he would answer him tomorrow, expecting the wahi, but without saying insha'Allah. And so the wahi was delayed. Also, when his own wife was falsely accused in her honor, the wahi was delayed as well, which was a very difficult time for the Prophet, peace be upon him. If he was the one making the Qur'an, wouldn't it have been more convenient for him to just come up with an answer in these situations and clear his name and his wives among his companions? These were not the only two incidents, but there are other situations in which the Prophet couldn't give a direct answer because he had to wait for the wahi. Problem number five, the challenge. The Qur'an contains many verses that challenge anyone who doesn't believe it. The challenge was to produce anything like it. The Qur'an even challenges humans and the jinn for that. If the Prophet, a human, had made the Qur'an himself, why would he risk embarrassing himself needlessly by challenging all humans and jinn to produce something like it? Problem number six the personal information of the Prophet. The Qur'an contains no personal information about the Prophet, not his life, his children, or his wives. His name was mentioned in the entire Qur'an only four times, which is much fewer than the mention of other Prophets. Like Moses, who was mentioned 134 times, and his story came in 34 surahs of the Qur'an. Jesus was also mentioned dozens of times, Abraham, Noah, Joseph, and other prophets. So if he was the one who had made the Qur'an himself, wouldn't he have given himself more credit, or at least talked about his struggles more often? So as we can see here, this first possibility that the prophet came up with the Qur'an himself is actually illogical and full of problems and questions for which there are no answers. Conclusion, it is impossible that the Prophet could have written the Qur'an himself. But could it be that he used the help of others? Well, then let's look at possibility number two. The Prophet used previous books like the Bible or the Torah to write the Qur'an. And this possibility could easily be refuted Because the Prophet was illiterate, which means that he could not read or write. And even if we assume that he was not illiterate, where would he have got hold of the Bible or the Torah in Arabic? Did you know that the first Arabic translation of the Bible was made in the 9th century, which is a hundred years after the death of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Then how could he have read it? Added to that, and until around the 18th century, the church was essentially hiding the Bible from common people and forbade its translation. So the Bible was not just readily available, let alone a translation thereof. This leaves us with no other conclusion than that the Prophet could not have used the previous books to write the Qur'an. This possibility is off the table. Moving to possibility number three. If the Prophet didn't write the Qur'an himself, he didn't read previous books, was it then a Jew or a Christian that helped the Prophet write the Qur'an? 
If we sift through all the authenticated hadith, you will only find a single hadith about the encounter between the Prophet and someone called Waraqa ibn Nawfal, a Christian. However, the Prophet met Waraqa ibn Nawfal after the Wahi or the revelation came to him, not before. Furthermore, based on authenticated hadith, Waraqa even testified that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the Prophet. So how could he have been the one who would help him to write the Qur'an? And even if it wasn't Waraqa and it was some other Christian or Jew who would help the Prophet to write the Qur'an, how could they allow him to write verses like these? لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ Or a verse like this. لَتَجِدَنَّ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الْيَهُودَ وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا How can it make sense that a Jew or a Christian would help the Prophet write something like that? This problem leaves us no choice but to say that it is impossible for anyone to have helped the Prophet write the Qur'an. Now, moving to the final possibility. Since the Prophet was able to tell prophecies and new things a human could not have known, then it must be Satan who would help him write the Qur'an. And this is indeed one of the most illogical possibilities, since we, as Muslims, are taught to seek refuge from Satan before starting to recite the Qur'an. فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Added to that, there are numerous verses in the Qur'an declaring Satan as the mortal foe of the human. So how could it be possible that Satan helped the Prophet to write verses cursing Satan himself and declaring him as the enemy? And why would Satan tell his plan to tempt humans and expose himself like that? Therefore, it is impossible for Satan to have helped the Prophet write the Qur'an. And now that all four possibilities out there are off the table, we are left with the only possibility that it is from the one with unlimited omniscient knowledge that the Qur'an is from Allah. And what better way to end this video than with Allah's words addressing those who deny the Qur'an. إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ ذي قوة عند ذي العرش مكين مطاع ثم أمين وما صاحبكم بمجنون ولقد رآه بالأفق المبين وما هو على الغيب بضنين وما هو بقول شيطان الرجيم فأين تذهبون إن هو إلا ذكر للعالمين لمن شاء منكم أن يستقيم وما تشاءون إلا أن يشاء الله رب العالمين How can we be sure? That the Qur'an we have today is the same Qur'an that the Prophet Muhammad taught to his companions over 1400 years ago. 
This question is central to the legitimacy of the religion of Islam. And to answer it, we need to know how the Quran was given to the Prophet, preserved by his companions, and then distributed around the Muslim world. This is the story of language, history, and the commitment of an entire civilization to preserving the words of God. According to the Muslim understanding, the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad over 23 years, from the age of 40 to his death at the age of 63. Over those 23 years, he received the revelation from God in a number of ways. Most commonly, it was spoken to him directly by the angel Gabriel, but at other times, it came during his dreams. And on a number of occasions, it even came to him directly from God, and he experienced this as the sound of a heavy bell after which the words of the revelation were made clear to him. Throughout those 23 years, the Prophet endeavoured to share the revelation with those around him as soon as it came. He did this verbally, as he couldn't read or write, but he strongly encouraged others around him to write down the revelation, as well as memorise it. This was the basis of how Muslims believe the Qur'an became preserved, not purely through written or oral means, but with both strengthening the other. The companions around him constantly strove to memorize these verses, with many eventually memorizing the entire book. Mm. And they simultaneously wrote them down on whatever materials they had around them, from parchment to bone to wood and stone. Over time, at least 65 companions functioned as scribes for the Prophet, who eventually established a school in Medina dedicated to teaching 900 of his companions to read and write. However, the dialect of the Qurayshi tribe that the Prophet spoke in wasn't the only dialect of the Arabian Peninsula. And as the religion was adopted by a growing number of tribes, they began to struggle with understanding the Qur'an. To overcome this, the Prophet was given permission to teach the Qur'an in seven of the main dialects in the region, allowing the message to be understood more widely. But these dialects didn't really affect the written records, as they were only different when the Qur'an was actually vocalized. So this was the state of the Qur'an at the death of the Prophet. Hundreds of companions who had memorized the complete Qur'an in seven official dialects, all of which were considered valid ways of reciting the Qur'an, as well as an incredible amount of written records that were held by the Prophet's companions throughout Medina and beyond. The placing of each verse within each chapter had been established by the Prophet before he died. But because each chapter functions as an independent unit, the companions had different ways of ordering the chapters themselves within the book as a whole. With the death of the Prophet, the leadership of the Muslim community passed to his close friend Abu Bakr, who was quickly beset by conflict on the outskirts of the now considerably large Muslim state. This conflict led to the Battle of Yamama, which saw many of those who had memorized the Qur'an killed. Many of these memorizers, known as Hafad, did survive but it highlighted the critical issue of preserving the entirety of the Qur'an, which was in danger if all of them were killed. Abu Bakr decided to appoint Zayd ibn Thabit to compile all of the written verses of the Qur'an into one collection, using only those verses which had been written in the presence of the Prophet himself. These manuscripts would then be verified by those who had memorized the entire Qur'an at the hands of the Prophet. This was where the important concept of Tawatur or multiply attested sources came into play. In order to be 100% sure that a verse of the Qur'an was in fact a verse of the Qur'an, it needed to have multiple independent chains of transmission from different memorizers of the Qur'an. In this way, any verse that came to Zayd could be corroborated through both written and oral means, essentially guaranteeing that every single verse put in the final book was conveyed by the Prophet. Once this had been completed by Zayd, he penned the completed text, which became known as the Suhuf, and gave it to Abu Bakr. This was now the official text of the Qur'an. With the death of Abu Bakr, it was given first to Umar, and then to Hafsa, the widow of the Prophet, when Umar passed away. Throughout this time, the religion had spread incredibly rapidly, now reaching from Libya in the west to Khurasan in the east. With this influx of non-Arabs who had embraced Islam, those seven official dialects began to cause some issues, Variant readings were beginning to crop up, and in order to stamp out the issue, the then Caliph Uthman decided that the original Qurayshi dialect would have to become the official reading of the Qur'an. 
he appointed a committee of 12 companions to essentially repeat the process of Zayd ibn Thabit, gathering all of those primary sources, rectifying any differences, and confirming them with those who had memorized the text orally. Once this had been completed, he sent for the original suhuf, which was still being held by Hafsa, and compared the two collections for any differences. Once completed, this final copy was read out to Uthman and the companions who all agreed upon its accuracy, and they decided to burn the original sources in order to avoid any future divergence with the text. Now this text is referred to as the Uthmani Mus'haf, and it was the first written Qur'an to be sent throughout the Muslim world with accompanying reciters. It's considered to be exactly the same as the Qur'an we read today, with only one pretty big difference. It didn't include any skeletal or diacritical marks, which are essential in differentiating different words which otherwise look exactly the same. For example, this is the word for elephant, thil, and this is the verb to kiss something, qabbal. However, when you remove the markings, they both look exactly the same. This was how the Mus'haf was written. Now, whilst these diacritical marks weren't invented until 30 years after the death of Uthman, these markings, what are called skeletal dots, were known to the Arabs at the time of Uthman. But he must have intentionally decided not to include them in his original Mus'haf. Now, whilst we don't really know why, one possible reason is that he wanted to ensure that the Qur'an would always be taught and preserved through both written and oral methods. And that's where those official reciters who were sent out with copies of the Mus'haf came into play. Without these official teachers guiding them, students who studied the Qur'an wouldn't actually be able to read the text. But with both the written text and an official reciter, the Qur'an was now completely standardized and able to be transmitted across the Muslim world. Over time, however, the usefulness of this approach began to diminish, and within the Caliphate of Uthman, these skeletal dots began to be used in new copies of the Mus'haf, and this quickly became the standard for all personal copies of the Qur'an. So apart from the development of new calligraphy styles and publishing methods, every Qur'an from then until today has been exactly the same, and every Hafidh of the Qur'an has learned the exact same book by heart. That is a 1400-year mutawatir chain of people who learnt the same book from their teachers and taught the same book to their students, which is why until this very day we can open up a copy of the Qur'an and know with confidence that this is the same special book that was taught by the Prophet himself. <laughs>